We have a, uh, a, a great session this afternoon to, to bring you. We had a great session this morning, I think everybody would agree. Um, you know, as, as we build the content for the event, um, we can only do one of these a year because it takes us all year to come up with the content, basically. Um, it starts immediately after the event. So um, last year, we finished the event. We were pretty proud of it. And, um, you know, Ryan and Keith and I were talking. And al although we were proud of it, we also felt that um, we needed to shake up the content. We, we kind of felt like the content around portfolio construction and behavioral biases and correlation, diversification, it's all things we can learn more about. But we should also try to, you know, kind of push the agenda forward a bit. Right about then, we actually went and, and visited with a, a, a client, and he was really into Bitcoin at, in, in the moment. And um, um, we had looked into Bitcoin back in like 2015. Actually, when I went back, I decided I'm going to buy one Bitcoin as an experiment. So this is in June of 2017, and I went to open a Coinbase account. It turned out I already had a Coinbase account because I had opened it up in 2015. So I look at it, February 2015, the account was open. You, what you do is this ACH transfer, you exchange a penny, right? And that way they know that the link is in place. Uh, that penny was now worth 30 cents. And I was like, man, I wish I would have bought Bitcoin back in 2015. Um, but it started us down a process of, uh, for Ryan and I both, where we bought some Bitcoin, we bought some Ethereum. We did funny things. We sent it back and forth to each other. Like, I'm gonna send you a Bitcoin, you send me one. Like, how does this work? Um, you know, I bought something on overstock.com with a Bitcoin and had it delivered to my house. You know, here's this little thing that I bought with Bitcoin. Like, just trying to understand the plumbing of, of, of the whole system. And so and we, we, we learned things doing that. At, at one point, we had this golf trip, and, uh, and Ryan owed me $2,500. And Bitcoin was at $2,500. So we decide Ryan's going to buy a Bitcoin and send me the Bitcoin as payment. Great. And um, the next thing that happened is on Coinbase at the time, an ACH settlement took like seven days. In that seven days, the value of Bitcoin went to $1,800 from $2,500. So I said, well, you can give me a Bitcoin and a check for $700, you know? He says, I'll just give you the check for $2,500. And he does, and then Bitcoin went to $3,500. <laughs> So um, that was when we, you know, economists can explain it a lot, but we were able to viscerally understand that when your assets are in U.S. dollars and your liabilities are in U.S. dollars, interjecting a random number generator doesn't really serve much purpose. So it's hard for us to understand the value of using Bitcoin as a payment system when U.S. dollars are so prevalent and, and so easy for us. So we started working on content. What I did was... Everybody else in that world of cryptocurrencies um, goes on Reddit and Medium. You know, um, I was old school. I went and bought a book. Um, and the book I bought was called The Age of Cryptocurrency. And it was written by our next speaker, Michael Casey, and his partner, Paul Vigna. And um, it just felt like, wow, I just really enjoy the way he puts together the narrative and tells the story and the possibilities of this new technology that we've been talking about for several years but are just now watching it be deployed. Um, and when you read the book, too, you kind of get um, uh, Michael's background, you know, where previously he was a journalist for the Wall Street Journal for 18 years. Um, he's lived around the world. He's seen different things. And he sees many possible ap applications as we started building the content and discussed it with the crowd like you and other people, um, we felt a lot of resistance from our community that this is, you know, people use terms like Ponzi scheme. Um, people would talk about it's used for drug trafficking and all sorts of illicit activities. I took the time to point out that the number one currency used for drug trafficking is U.S. $100 bills. Um, <laughs> a very small percentage of it might, might, might be in, in currencies like this. Um, but we were able to sense from the industry a w lack of um, uh, jumping on the bandwagon, right? So this, next, this session this afternoon and tomorrow morning are really uh, designed to bring um, some applied education on this topic. You know, we really want for people to see 
the potential and that this is really happening and to start to get your head around it. Um, so with that, I'm going to give you Michael Casey. Great. So um, thanks for having me. Um, I'm very glad that, to hear Brian, you know, plugging a, a book of mine because um, I'm also going to plugging a second book here. This is I'm a, I'm a salesman when it comes to books, not not much else, I'm afraid. Um, and uh, love the story of the the, the, the golf trip exchange uh, because I think this next slide will you know be a pretty useful way to put this into context. So you know volatility. For those of us who've been in this space for a few years now, and I was just talking with Ariana, who will be with, with us uh, for the next uh, session, um, it's just sort of goes with the territory. Um, and it's, um, it's wild. And, and, and certainly, I, I share Brian's view that, that as a sort of a medium of exchange in a world that's denominated in dollars, Bitcoin doesn't serve, at least in its you know, raw form, much use in that, in that basic payment model. The volatility is problematic. But the volatility is also telling us a story. Um, there's, there's something big going on here. This is not just some sort of mad, crazy you know, circus. Uh, there is something very real. And I'm going to spend the rest of the next uh, 45 minutes or so just walking through what that big thing really is. But it's worth sort of looking back in time because, oops, this is not what I meant to do. I don't have a pointer, I thought I had a pointer. But um, maybe I do. Nope, okay. But if you look in the middle of the chart, uh, there's that blip, right? Down the middle there. That was 2013, about the time that you got your little one, one penny transaction with Coinbase, or probably just before it, right? Which would have been fabulous. That's the end of 2013, December. And if you, you know, reduce the chart back to 2013, it looks exactly like the chart does now in, uh, you know, 2017, the end of 2017, where we jumped up to $19,000. That was a, a move to $1,000. Uh, and it, it, everything is perspective, right? So I think what's possibly happening in terms of the price of Bitcoin and therefore the price of the whole sector with crypto generally is that we are having indeed bubbles, but we're possibly, because of how time is compressed in the crypto world, going through this cycle of bubble speculation, retrenchment, and recovery on, on a, at a much faster rate than we do, to the point where what, what truly could be described as a bubble in terms of the mania and the momentum and the kind of logic that the market takes off with is, is as much, in this world, a kind of a normal market correction. It seems pretty violent kind of correction to have to deal with, but I think this is part of what's going on. And uh, I'm taken by the work of Carlota Perez, who is a Venezuelan economist who's written quite extensively about the role that speculation and sort of bubbles and mania have played through history when there is a transformative technology taking hold. And it's, I think it's a very real way to think because when something big is coming on board and we don't quite know how to use it, what it's going to be for, where to throw our money, we kind of have this scattershot approach, right? Those who are excited about it and think this could be the next big thing, throw money at anything that's out there. Um, and some of it sticks, a lot of it doesn't. But in the process, we go through a business of unlocking capital and exploring what this sort of vague future looks like. And it's the case for electricity. It was the case for, obviously, the dot-com bubble. Um, it's, you, know, you go right back through history, and she sort of points out how these waves of innovation have come. And the, this speculative process has been critical to how society has actually integrated the, that technology. So it's interesting. It's like thinking about speculation, which we sort of, in the mainstream press, look upon, at least in these this sorts of contexts, as just madness and, and crazy Wild West scammers and everything else. Individually isolated, each of those cases can be thought of like that. But collectively, as a society, what we're all doing is actually laying down the foundations for change. And I'll talk a little bit about what I think is happening right now in terms of that foundational layer. But what I want to simply do now is like, why? Why is this the thing that has got people excited? You know, why do we think it might be the next internet or the next you know, electricity uh, arrival or the railroads? What is it about this technology that has the feel of that sort of groundbreaking transformation? And I'm going to 
you know, admittedly, I'm invested in this space and mainly just intellectually, not necessarily. I wish I had, you know, had put a dollar back in 2013 or whatever into, into things. But I'm, I'm invested in this space personally, so obviously I'm a little biased. But I am going to try to make the case that this is a technology that actually changes. It's not just a 10 years in the making kind of shift here. This is something that goes back for millennia. Now, this is why this is a big deal. This is a paradigm shift of importance. So I like to frame this by referring to Yuval Harari, who is a brilliant writer, a political scientist from Israel, wrote a great book called Sapiens, and came up with a, a notion as to why we, and not, say, the bonobos, or uh, the dolphins, or the penguins, or anybody else, rules the earth. Or how did we become powerful? Because in fact, our intelligence isn't that far off the bonobos or the chimps or anyone else. We're fairly similar. We know this from our DNA. And he says it's our capacity to tell stories and communicate ideas to each other in such a way that we all agree upon a set of facts. And once we reach that consensus, we're able to build things on it. So religion is a kind of a consensus idea. It's not necessarily true, but it's a sufficient truth for us to organize on top of that. So my book, the, the new one that you all have a copy of, is called The Truth Machine. And it, we're not talking about absolute truth. We're not saying that with the blockchain, you will know absolute truth and that you can't lie into a blockchain. You absolutely can. You can immutably lie. But it's rather this more interesting process, I think, of how society itself comes together and agrees on a truth, a shared truth. So this process, this process of consensus, is absolutely critical to finance. You know, we all have to agree what we think the inflation rate is. There's no absolutely true inflation rate. I mean, there is, but God knows what it is. It's a consensus. We figured it out, right? That's what a market is. So this process of consensus building is really, really important. And to do that, we have to have records. We have to have a series of of a history upon which to make conclusions about what, what, what we think the current state is, the current state of anything. And record keeping, therefore, is this just really, really important piece of civilization. It's no coincidence that the um, beginnings of civilization are there with uh, the Code of Hammurabi in the early days of of civilization in Babylon, like 1700 BC. So once we could codify transactions and keep a record of that, human beings could then come together and say, all right, well, this is what we agree upon. Now let's enter into an exchange. So the act of exchange, the act of transacting with each other, depends upon an agreed consensus around a set of facts. And what we do with that is we overcome this vital other aspect of uh, human civilization, of mistrust, to form this critical part of trust. So trust is this you know, it's, it's, it's something that we just simply can't be without. And simply, we would never have you know, moved out of the trees and formed villages and settlements and tribes and everything else and then moved on to how we did if we hadn't forged trust amongst ourselves. But what we've done is rely on institutions to do this. And by that I don't just mean, uh, you know, governments and laws. Things like language and culture are actually institutions as well and they are part of the process by which we come together. I like to think of language as a protocol. It's a protocol that we can use as a set of rules around which we can now agree to communicate our ideas, and on that basis, we trust each other. And now we can, again, enter into exchange. Right? Forming a basis of trust to enter into exchange is just this fundamental process. But what we've done, for the most part, in the financial world, and certainly, therefore, across the entire you know, record-keeping layer of the economy, is to transfer this record-keeping role to a centralized ledger keeper. So this guy here, um, he's actually a more important banker in history than Jamie Dimon, believe it or not. His name's uh, Giovanni de' Medici. And at the end of the 15th century, he and his, uh, his family members realized that bringing double-entry bookkeeping into the banking system would be a very powerful way to transform banks from just being straightforward uh, you know, credit providers to inserting themselves into the global payment system. Because now that we had this ledger keeper that could keep track of 
one guy's debits and another one's credits, you could effectively create payment and money, right? So this was the beginnings of how banks ended up becoming integral to the entire monetary payment system. So once they figured this out, they could just simply debit the account <coughs> of uh, someone, someone else and, uh, you know, the merchant in Venice could now get paid by a, uh, an importer in London and no longer did they have to rely on just face-to-face -face transfers of funds, of, of coins or of, of, of notes. And uh, the end result was, of course, the Renaissance, the Industrial Revolution, and uh, you know, this, the modern world was effectively built upon the unlocking of finance and, and payments because of this centralised ledger-keeping system that the banks created. And so for all the problems that banks have, have caused, they've also done an enormous amount of good. But centralising the ledger-keeping function has a problem. And I'm going to use two words to describe that. <laughs> Lehman Brothers. The Lehman Brothers is what uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonymous creator of Bitcoin, um, referred to as a th trusted third party. Right, so this, this idea that we can't have money, we can't keep a, a, a system of exchange without a, a tr a, some, having to trust some entity in the middle was the core problem that uh, Satoshi was looking to resolve. And it's not just that you know, Lehman's was uh, diddling the books or subject to corruption and you know you, we can take what you know, nobody was ever uh, sent up to jail from Lehman so you know it's it's not really necessarily the point whether they, they were good or bad or right or wrong it's simply that the fact of trust is the problem and we can think of uh, the result of that fallout as what I describe as the cost of trust so we all know what happened how much money was lost how many people lost their jobs how much angst the world was put through and all of the fallout that came from it, right? So it's a failure of our trust system is, is, is one form of cost in there. But the cost of trust is actually sort of more subtle through this, that, that, that's raised by this problem of centralized ledgers. So I like to think of the image of all the skyscrapers of the world filled with cubicles, filled with accountants. All of those accountants are reconciling their company's books with somebody else's company's books. Each of them a centralized, siloed set of facts, a different version of the truth, right? But because we don't trust each other across these entities, we go through this process of reconciling, of proving, of auditing, and everything else. The amount of time and money and effort that goes into the exercise of resolving this lack of trust across our siloed record-keeping functions is almost unfathomably large, right? So what if we have a system that decentralized that process and now we have a shared record of truth? Right? This is the promise of this technology, that we could actually have this consensus process, this fundamentally civilization building important process of consensus building done in real time, that we would have a record of truth that we all agree on now, at any given moment. Like it's, it's profound. It, it means that out goes the quarterly uh, cycle by which we judge the earnings of a particular company. Out goes the quarterly cycle and the annual cycle by which economic numbers are produced because at any given time we know what we all agree on to be the truth. So you can see when you start to push this out to ex its extreme, it is really a big deal. Now, I and many others working in this space are not Pollyanna-ish to, enough to, to think that we can snap our fingers and this magical new world's going to happen immediately. In fact, it probably will never reach that, that broad picture I just painted. But if you just think about the possibilities in these terms, I think it becomes very big. And then what we will talk about both now and later on the panel is how much work is going into this in an open source collaborative way to resolve the challenges that we face in getting to that point. And that's actually one of the most exciting things about what's happening. But let's sort of uh, get back to what Satoshi Nakamoto was, was trying to do uh, to sort of figure out how he you know, gave us the chance to at least think about this idea of a decentralized distributed ledger that uh, no single person controls, right? So the, the idea is to get rid of trust in a third party and have our record keeping function agreed to by everybody in a, in a, in a consensual process. So it came down to money um, and this was the, 
the, the, the sort of the core use case because at the end of the day, you can't have money that can be double spent. So money is a record keeping function and uh, you know, certainly one dollar cannot be used twice. Our entire monetary system would break down. This was the core problem of, um, of, of sort of a de decentralized uh, internet based money that um, the world uh, you know, that, that, that was sort of thought of as a possibility once the internet came along. But the idea was, you know, all right, so this is my mother, by the way. She's, uh, she lives in Perth, and that's my Twitter avatar, so I use this as my little thing. And I've, I'm a long way away from Perth, Australia, so I think, oh, I want to send my money to my mum. I should be able to do so because money is just information. Why can't I just send her the money, right? Uh, and, and the core, and this is obviously my money, not, not, not through a bank, but I've got the cash on my computer. Well, the simple problem is because there's no way to know in the internet, at least there wasn't until Bitcoin came along, that I couldn't just copy, replicate that file. If we think of it, this is not necessarily the right way to think about it, but if you think of it as a PDF file, for example, I can just make a copy of the PDF file and send that to my friend in Rome. Um, the whole system breaks down, right? So that, this is called the double spend problem, and it was uh, at the, the nub of the issue that had to be resolved. And everyone, you know, that was working on this before Satoshi came along, and there were a lot of these cypherpunks that, that sort of, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s especially, started to explore these ideas. And they knew that um, it had to be a, a, a distributed consensus system, so that you would have all these computers come together and agree on, on what each, whether each transaction was valid or not. So that I had no, you know, technically had have no control over that process. I had to defer it to the community. Um, and so this was a process, a, a vote if you like. 51% 50, of the computers say that this is a legitimate transaction, then it's fine. It can't be double spent. But the problem is that um, just as I can replicate information about you know, some asset like a, a dollar on the internet, you can also replicate yourself. Right? You think about all the, the bots that get produced and there's no, there's no real way to, to know that I myself would not be just creating multiple nodes across the system. So it's Michael Casey 1, Michael Casey 2, Michael Casey 2, but of course I wouldn't call myself that. It would be some hidden, you know, hard to decipher name. And I would just then rot the system and uh, it can still double spend because I could take over the vote, if you like. So this is actually something that, that stood as a barrier to the ability to, to achieve this holy grail of decentralized money on the internet for a long time. And in fact, the kind of idea died down a little bit once you know, VeriSign and these guys facilitated credit card payments and we just basically jury-rigged the decentralized model of the internet with a centralized model of, of money. And, and that's what we live with until right around the time of the big Lehman Brothers collapse, Satoshi Nakamoto emerges out of nowhere and says, hey, I've got a solution. And his solution aimed out of something called proof of work. Proof of work is a, an algorithmic function that he took from an earlier idea called Hashcash, um, produced by a guy called Adam Back, who's now quite a significant player in the Bitcoin space. And Hashcash was designed as an anti-spam mechanism. And Adam Back realized that you know, one way to stop spammers was to charge them. Every time you want to send some spam email, you have to spend money. But to go back to the original problem, we didn't have a way to do decentralized money over the, over the internet, so to charge somebody was impossible, uh, at least by the very small micropayments that you would want to impose upon a, a spamming system. So what he did was to say, um, I'm, rather than sort of charge you direct dollars or cents, or micro cents, um, I'm going to make you do a computational task. And that's not going to cost you very much to send one email. Your computer's going to do this little bit of you know, business trying to figure out a cryptographic puzzle. But um, if you have to do that over and over and over again, it's going to be very expensive for you to send out m a million spam emails. So this idea was, it works, it worked. It didn't necessarily take off, but it worked. And Satoshi thought, I could apply this to the same function of sort of the integrity of the nodes in the network for, for this decentralized money. So he created this algorithm that, that, that effectively is called proof of work uh, that requires each of the nodes in the system to 
undertake this crypt to basically search for a number in what is really a massive digital haystack of numbers. And the thing about math is that you can make that haystack as big as you like. It's just add the number of permutations up to infinity, right? So what he has is an adjusted function in this and that um, the more hashing power, the more computing power that gets added to the system, the harder that task becomes and it's all calibrated in such a way that, that it, it you know, sticks to it. And what this meant was that you could now have a permissionless distributed system. And this was an absolute breakthrough. So it didn't matter who you were participating in this network. I like to say that ISIS could be a Bitcoin miner and it actually wouldn't matter. I don't usually like to say that if I'm sitting down with regulators as to whether or not Bitcoin's a good idea, but it's actually the core concept. Your identity doesn't matter. It's whether or not you are appropriately incentivized to carry out the validation work for this ledger uh, and disincentivize to try, try to take it over. And that's what this proof of work does. So each of the miners is rewarded with Bitcoin. So it's kind of like a payment for the purposes of being a validator. It's the most important way to think about, in my mind, what Bitcoin's function is. It's secondarily is a currency. Obviously, those two things are intertwined. You wouldn't want to be rewarded in something that wasn't useful. But the starting point for thinking about what Bitcoin is, is it's its reward for this proof of work function that you do. And since we're all competing to get this Bitcoin, we are all carrying out this proof of work, it becomes this security system for the entire network. So once it all came together, multiple proof of work stakes, each done by these computers, each one of them sort of hunting for the right to earn the next Bitcoin, delivered as a, 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 what, through the process of, of building blocks of transactions that go into what now we call the blockchain. He built it, and it's been running for nine years now, and no one has ever taken it down. And there's just, you know, $100 billion worth of value in there that is like a, a massive bounty for anybody to attack. And it hasn't happened. So the greatest test of the security of this system is that. You can put aside the volatility and the price and all that sort of stuff, obviously very important, and that's something that we can talk about. But the idea that we have something that is worth a lot of money uh, to a lot of people that hasn't been broken says a lot when you're, it's out there in the wild. It's an open source system, right? There's no one in charge. Um, so that's really the core point here. Um, and uh, the, the thing is, once sort of people realized how profound this was, they started thinking, okay, what, what does it all mean? What, this is something quite revolutionary. What can we do with it? And sort of Bitcoin was one of the first things we thought about in terms of its currency, but we've moved on from there. But before I talk about some of the other use cases, I want to you know, just break down some of the elements of it. So the blockchain itself, the word that everyone's using now as, as a word, it's really, it, didn't even, it wasn't even used by Satoshi himself. It, was, it sort of emerged later on. I think he called it a chain of blocks initially. Um, it's nonetheless very important. I mean, it is the ledger. It is this, it is this sort of distributed ledger that, that we are appealing to as a potential solution to the centralized record keeping role. And it's constructed of blocks of transactions, um, all of which are cryptographically linked. So uh, the system makes a hash of each transaction, with all the data that's attached to that. A hash is a, a, a cryptographic record expressed as a string of, of numbers and letters, effectively, uh, that has a lot of really cool qualities to it in terms of how difficult it is to actually break what the underlying data is underneath it, out of brute force, as they say but how it's actually relatively easy to verify if you do have the numbers that this hash corresponds to what you have. So it has this double sort of asymmetrical quality that, that gives it this, this very powerful security component. And it's all linked so that it's like a, each, that once, once you sort of build all these blocks together, you end up with hashes of hashes of hashes. And one of the qualities of a hash is that if you, if you just change a minute part, the smallest part, just a decimal point, of the underlying data, it completely changes the hash entirely, unrecognizably so. So if you take that idea and you apply it right through the blockchain from the very beginning, and you wanted to amend, go back and sort of fiddle with one of those transactions to double spend, it would send misinformation right the way through the blockchain and just show what it is. And so this is these, a core component of the security is in fact this uh, you know, cryptographic quality. And what it gives us therefore, 
is, is, is a regular, based on the, the sort of difficulty function that, that's in there and the way the algorithm works, every 10 minutes or so, more or less, a block of transactions has this time-stamped quality, quality to it. And because it is so very, very difficult, in fact, very, very expensive, because you think about that proof of work, it's a costly exercise in terms of all the computation you have to do, all the electricity you have to spend to do this. Because of that, we, we call it an immutable ledger. I so say we call it, and I put it in quotes, because, of course, nothing is absolutely immutable. There would be a way to take over this thing. But the point is that up until now, no one has been able to, because the cost of doing so is so high. So we have this immutable, time-stamped, shared truth. And that's a pretty big deal, right? We've, we've um, never really had a record of history that, that couldn't be changed before. So the very idea of having a record of history that cannot change is, is just, regardless of whether Bitcoin is useful to repay your buddy for the debt that you owe him, um, that very simple idea is, is critical. And there's this other function in there that I think is important. Um, once software is, once money is software, uh, it ceases to be agnostic. It doesn't just, uh, so money right now, you don't really, it doesn't do anything it, it, in, on an, in and of itself. It simply represents value and therefore we can trade it for anything else. But once money is tied to software, uh, it can do kind of things. It can, you can program it to pay for this but not pay for that, right? So you might figure out a way to build a crypt cryptocurrency that could pay for your son's uh, college tuition, send him money to buy books and things like that, but he can't use it at the bar, right? And, and that means that there's this sort of powerful capacity now to use our money as, as a sort of a vehicle in, in the process of developing uh, our, our economic exchanges and our systems of uh, business relationships and everything else. And a key part of what makes that happen is, a key part of it is, is, is concept of a smart contract. Uh, and a smart contract is um, a misnomer. There's, <laughs> there's uh, really a contract is something that goes outside of, um, uh, it lives outside of uh, the transaction. This is about how we execute the, the, the contract. Um, but it, it, it's the very idea that uh, the agreements that we could strike could now be automated in such a way that neither party could interfere in is, again, a very powerful idea that people are getting very excited about. And you know, we already have smart contracts to, to a large extent. Whenever you, you know, ask your bank to pay your credit card on such and such a date on an automated basis, you could agree that that's a smart contract. But the key difference is you're trusting the bank to execute that. So when we think about smart contracts as something that, that neither party has control over because the computation that's required to execute that contract is being proven by this decentralized network of validators, now we can start to think about some pretty powerful things. And so supply chains, for example, people think about how we can start to automate contracts and automate delivery of goods and things like that along a supply chain because neither party needs to worry that the other one is not trying to build the other. Now, Bitcoin, I just explained to you how it works, where it came from. I think of it as the first use case. We've since had a number of use cases that are actually effectively working and countless others that everyone are looking into. But it's also, most importantly, the first digital asset. Before Bitcoin, it was, there was no such thing as a digital asset. Um, anything that was digital could be copied. Uh, so your iTunes account that you had um, was not a case of buying like, physically, uniquely identified songs, but a perpetual license from Apple. And it was litigated. That's how they managed access and rights to this contracted deal. There's no such thing as a uniquely identified digital song. But now, with Bitcoin, you have this, the very first digital asset, that, that, that there is a representation of some form of digital value, a unique, scarce asset. And that's really, really, really powerful again, because we've now got all of the powers of software that we know that we can program to do these powerful things for us, and we can map the world of value into that realm. And now we can start to use these digital assets and the way that we trade them as ways to actually share rights to the rest of the world, the, the, the rest of the world of value, the physical world and our assets generally. And there's lots of other use cases. So, so um, we're, we're, we're 
particularly interested in the financial sector around this idea of real-time trade settlement. You've probably heard about R3 and digital asset holdings and, and the like. Um, you know, the moment, much of that work is, is being done around uh, what we refer to as permissioned ledgers, and this is a key distinction from Bitcoin. Um, and it's also, I think many of us would argue, uh, a bit of a step backwards. Uh, because, as I said, what Bitcoin was trying to prove was this possibility to have a permissionless system that anybody could participate in. And the argument behind the permission system, which is usually thought of as a consortium, uh, like a federated structure where the validators are all, have all come together under an agreement to maintain that ledger and they follow different forms of consensus, not proof of work, but things like um, something called practical Byzantine fault tolerance. And these systems are pretty robust. They, they allow for, at any given time, all of the nodes to feel confident that uh, it, this system couldn't be overtaken. But at the end of the day, it's flawed from the perspective of the very you know, pure, uh, utopian, decentralized vision of Bitcoin, because that consortium itself is now a gatekeeper. It actually has authority over the ledger, so it could change the ledger, right? And that actually might be a good thing. I'm not holding a position here. And certainly, Banks and others are not ready to submit the ledger of all of their, their transactions to something as unruly as Bitcoin. Uh, and so the, the, the post-trade uh, uh, settlement systems that are being developed are very much geared around, um, around these permission systems. But they really you know, do portend something pretty, pretty powerful if we can move because of all the security that comes from knowing about that, that sort of cryptographically secured transfer of near real-time exchange, and potentially peer-to-peer -peer between you know, either, in, either investor. Um, a lot of all the hops, the clearing, the settlement, all that stuff could potentially be removed from the process, which would not only you know, save money in terms of those processes, but if we bring it down to T plus zero, it would unlock massive amounts of money that sits on the sidelines waiting for that settlement to happen. So we're talking about a lot of money. There's alternative lending systems that are being, that are being kind of developed here um, around things like trade finance. And so and, uh, this can go right down to all of these small and medium enterprises that, uh, or just farmers who for years have never been able to prove that the crops that they have you know, stored in some warehouse, they actually have rights to because the warehouse's receipt system is, is very unreliable. And if we were to register those receipts into a, a ongoing immutable record. Like, so now we take the data that is outside of the system and we record it into a blockchain transaction. And in fact, there's a, a project out of MIT where I work specifically doing this called Be Verify, taking warehouse receipts and recording it as a hash into the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, then arguably banks and others could trust that data and they'd be able to get letters of credit that they haven't been able to do for, before. Supply chain management is seen as a very um, useful and, and sort of almost uh, uh, obvious use for this because the goal behind a blockchain really is to resolve the problem of mistrust across entities who have good reasons not to trust each other but also have a very good reason to desire a common outcome. Right? So a supply chain's end goal is for everybody to have sell as many of the final goods as possible, but along the way there's all this mistrust. So, if we could start to register work processes and various elements of the transactional record that goes along that chain into an immutable record that we can all trust and we can bring in a whole lot of other encryption and interesting privacy solutions so that everyone's not necessarily showing their books all the time, then you know, we start to get this capacity to have much better visibility and transparency along the chain. So provenance, which is a key concern in, uh, in supply chain, starts to go away. Um, the Internet of Things, I think, once pushed to its ultimate uh, limit, where there's tens of billions of, of devices transacting with each other and they don't care whether you belong, belong to this system or that system. So we're talking about different wall gardens having to talk to each other. Uh, it's going to need something like a blockchain. I use the word something like because I'm not saying that the existing blockchains would be up to this task, certainly not in terms of scalability, but the very idea of a decentralized trust architecture, which is what this ultimately is, needs to be there if IoT is going to happen properly. I don't really want Google to run IoT. Right? We don't want the data that comes from that to be controlled by any party. 
um, and we want to be able to ensure that devices can talk to each other across whatever boundaries we have. And I, I think we need something like a blockchain to deal with that. Property titles is another one where we're recording something into uh, uh, the, the blockchain uh, and, and potentially getting away with all that title insurance problem that we get because at any given time we'll know, uh, you know the history of transactions through there, where the deed has, has happened. Um, I'm interested in decentralized energy in particular and the idea of smart property once we bring these devices and we give them the capacity to be turned on or off. Remember we said money is now programmable. So when a payment is made, it can execute something, in this case, turning on or off a device. Now all of a sudden you can start to think about collateralizing uh, access to power in a remote community. If they don't make their payments, the thing turns off. Right? It's a sort of a form of informal foreclosure, but it's a, a temporary one that you can start to have a, as a way to manage access to, to power and give more confidence to lenders and hopefully, hopefully therefore unlock a lot of funding that's really going to be needed to roll out the uh, sort of distributed solar and renewable energy systems that we need uh, going forward. And then the core problem of identity. So, you know, 2.5 billion around, people around the world don't have access to official identity. But more than that, we really have a completely broken system of identity. I should say the word Equifax, and uh, you'll, you'll get what I mean. Um, we have this breakdown between the digital uh, world and digital identity, and whether or not this is possible. D identity is a really hard nut to crack. But um, the idea that we could register our data in a blockchain and therefore have something transportable and be able to prove attributes about who I am could be very, very uh, powerful. Uh, so um, that's a quick bit of a rundown. Real-time trade settlement, as I said, we, we're going to be able to sort of shift from something as dramatic, uh, as sort of like cumbersome as this, to something potentially as uh, you know, automatic as this. And again, that's, that's, that's something that I think is, is uh, going to very, very uh, dramatically shift the, uh, the functioning of the capital market system. Um, one form of alternative lending that, are, that uh, I think is also worth talking about is this idea of a ROSCA. So um, there's a sort of rotating savings and credit association. Uh, these things have existed for years. They are just basically saving circles. People put in a bit of money every week, and then somebody takes part of that out. And um, with, the, uh, with, with, with this capacity, though, we've never been able to, to build that beyond the trust that's needed in the system. Potentially, with a blockchain, we can start to expand access to these systems and un unlock credit around the world. As I said, supply chain management is critical. This provenance problem, I think, is best uh, demonstrated if we think about Chipotle. You remember um, they had a problem a couple of years ago with some E. coli in their, uh, in their burritos, and uh, their share price never recovered, collapsed completely, simply because they couldn't figure out where the E. coli came from. I think they eventually decided that it had come from a, a slaughterhouse in Australia. Um, but uh, it's not very useful to just know that some slaughterhouse somewhere in Australia two years ago had caused this thing. The idea of knowing at any given time where a problem exists within your supply chain is, is pretty powerful. Um, you know, in trade finance, uh, there are, um, I think, more than 50% of the world's SMEs have their uh, small and medium enterprises, have their requests for letters of credit turned down by the bank. There's like, I don't know, tens of billions of, of fraud in this system. China's uh, copper price collapsed at some point because people were sort of putting fraudulent bills of lading into the system. So registering these documents so that they cannot be double spent, they cannot be double pledged or double lent is, is, is one way to both prevent the fraud but also unlock credit for those whose documents have never been trustworthy. I think one of the, the cool things about IoT, if you think about, you know, as I was saying before, how we can unlock the capacity for these, uh, these devices who don't necessarily trust each other's systems to, tra to transact across each other, is, is how money might be able to be used to extract efficiencies from our system. So if you think about congestion as a problem and resolving it, well, think of a car, a self-driving car, being able to pay another self-driving car to move it aside so that I can get through. <laughs> it's, you know, if, we, if we're going to trust these, these vehicles in this way, I mean, this may be the best way to resolve congestion, that there's a, there's a price on, uh, on congestion. Um, and uh, the example I gave here is just, uh, this is just a, the Daimler trucks are doing something along these, these lines as well where, you know, they're all in a line and um, 
the efficiency that, that is gained from the slipstream effect is, is valuable to this, what they call a pl platoon of trucks. Uh, and at this case, it's, oh, they're all Daimler trucks, and they're all using Daimler system, there's no money involved. But one could imagine, again, trucks all randomly coming together. And the guy at the end is paying the guy in the front for, for bearing the cost of the energy they have to absorb, those sorts of things. So there's just ways to think about the phenomenal efficiencies that we might be able to extract when money becomes programmable and when our devices are able to respond in these kinds of ways to, the, to all of this. Um, I, I mentioned property titles uh, in the context of um, the developed world, uh, you know, the title insurance and all of the costs that come. You all remember how many stacks and pieces of paper you have to sign the last time you uh, got a mortgage and, and uh, either bought or sold a house. But think about the developing world where, you know, this apparently, according to Hernando to Soto, $20 trillion of dead capital. Because the people in this favela, Brazil, um, you know, they own their homes, but there's no way for them to prove that they own it. Right? So this idea of proving who I am, what I've done, and uh, what I own is a sort of a critical part of this. And then just leave you again with identity, because as I say, it's, a, it's, it's this sort of fundamental core aspect of uh, how we you know, operate in the world. We've, we've constructed a notion of identity that is uh, very much tied to this very outdated analog systems. And I think if you, one of the best examples of what's broken with that system is to think about, um, if you go to a bar, I keep using the bar reference, but it works. <laughs> I'm talking to the right crowd, I know that much. Uh, you know, you need to prove that you're over, you're over the age of 21, you'll show this little card that has all this extra ancillary information, your full name, your address, uh, your driver's license number in New York, they even have the color of your eyes, which seems like a redundant thing to me since you can see them, presumably. Um, a whole lot of data that you really don't necessarily want the bar keep to have, right? In fact, you don't even, he doesn't even need to know your birthday, which is the thing he's looking at there. Um, he only needs to know the answer to one binary question. Are you or are you not over the age of 21, right? And the idea that we can unlock proofs of this and you know, in a distributed way, access those proofs. And so you, there's a query that goes out, and my data pool that um, I'm controlling and no one else has access to is going to send you an answer to that. And because of the distributed nature of the blockchain and the various ways in which attestations and proofs get built up, this is a much more, this is something that, that the bar keep can trust. We start to think about how we might be able to start interacting in this world together, this very of messy digital world with, with more autonomy on it of our own. Um, and I think it's very important in the wake of the sort of Facebook um, Cambridge Analytica concept to think about it. So let's just, you know, we're going to talk more about tokens and money and, and, the, and the market and everything else in the next session. Um, but let's just sort of, I want, I want to just think a little bit about why I think the token concept is really, really exciting. Uh, these are just representations, this is pretty old in fact, I'm sure this, this is way, way out of date, but they're just representations of the amount of money that was raised. And that's what everyone thinks about, right? Tezos raised $250 million and Bancor was maybe uh, 150 or something and Filecoin somewhere in the same realm with Tezos and there's been EOS that's now even bigger and of course, um, you know, the Telegram ICO is possibly pushing up towards $2 billion. Everyone's like, wow, this is disrupting venture capital and everyone's focusing on this and of course the SEC is getting interested and, and there's probably you know, a number of uh, lawsuits that are about to happen and you know, it's all legitimate and, and the right conversation to be having to an extent. What I worry about is that we're all focused on that aspect of it, the money raising part of it and forgetting the really exciting thing. And this is this concept of a utility token. So these tokens, remember we talked about money being programmable. I can start to embed into my money, my medium of exchange, a set of rules. So as a community, and that can be a physical community, or it can be a community that happens to participate in an activity like what Filecoin does, which is to say share distributed access to computing resources. Um, and because we're all in this community together, we all agree that this thing should be used for this, but not for that. So now our money starts to become a vehicle for, for governance. It's a way to resolve what, what I, I like to call um, the, you know, the, the sort of tragedy of the commons solution for this marketplace. Um, the tragedy of the commons was this idea that we can't, um, we can never 
get over our own self-interest. And we're always incentivized to pursue that, even though there's a public good that we would want to resolve. And this goes right back to a famous essay in 1968, a guy called Garrett Hardin. He just showed that these cow herders would inherently go out and overgraze the commons because they couldn't trust that the other guy was going to do it. But Bitcoin, and this is, by the way, this is why he says we had to have government. Government comes in and, and helps us achieve what we all agree is a, is, a, is a good goal and overcome our trust problems. Um, but it was always external governance and it comes with politics and corruption and all those things we all know all about. But the idea of embedding into our own system of exchange an internal governance system so that the, the money we are using is actually starting to carry out the instructions that we would want all of us to do to preserve whatever it is we're trying to preserve. And it doesn't have to be something physical like a grassland, but it's, it's a resource like computing resources. That starts to get like a big idea. And Bitcoin's really, in that sense, its greatest achievement in many respects is the fact that it, it, it did, at least in this narrow use case, solve the tragedy of the commons. Because each of these miners, the validators, is acting in their self-interest entirely. As I said, it could be ISIS. But by virtue of doing that, they're collectively achieving this public good. And the public good is this immutable ledger that cannot be changed. So this is a, a big deal, right? So it's a game why I think there is you know, a bubble, but a bubble that is exciting and, 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 and worth really thinking hard about. Um, and I think if you think back to what the dot-com bubble was, whereby there was uh, you know, the pets.com story and Webvan and these other things that we just look back with laughter at and say, all those crazy people who were duped and all the money that was lost and we think about this a lot, right? It's a story of excess and wild westness. Um, what was happening underneath all of that was something that Carlo de Perez would talk about, that capital was still being unlocked and used in ways that we weren't even noticing. And massive amounts of fiber optic cable were laid at this time. 3D, uh, 3G mobile technology was developed at that time. Big data centers were laid, out, laid down. And then the bubble went and all that stuff was sitting there nice and cheap. And Google came along rubbing its hands and said, thank you, and built Internet 2.0, right? So we've got cloud computing and, smart, uh, and uh, smartphones, and then we've got you know, social media and, and uh, everything else that we now take for granted was built on the back of the infrastructure that was built during the dot-com bubble. What's happening now, I think, is something similar, but it's not physical infrastructure. It's social infrastructure. Uh, these tokens that we refer to, the, the, there are developers that are incentivized by those tokens to participate in the development of this technology in a decentralized, open source, collaborative way. So they're incentivized effectively to write down, write open source code that captures this idea, this social ideas of these, of these communities. And a lot of those ideas are bunk and they're all going to fail. But what will be left is this base layer, this open source code that anybody can come along and pick up and build something on top of, which is what Satoshi did with Hashcash and Merkle trees and a whole lot of other things that he worked into the Bitcoin code. So we're laying down the foundation for the decentralized economy of the future. And um, I think that's pretty exciting. And I think it's a good reason to think about why this mania exists. And uh, we can talk more about it later on, but I can take some questions as well. If, if, yep, we'll take some questions. Um, anybody got any to throw at me? <laughs> Blank faces. No, no, there's some hands come up. Okay, sorry, yeah. I, I, I like the idea of uh, going by car slowly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, you could actually. That, 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 that's, that's one of the ways you could do it, just, just quietly passing away the time. And somebody on a, on a hurry to the airport or the uh, hospital will, will pay you just to sit there. No, that's, that's, that's the way to think about it. But it's ultimately like, you know, time is an asset, right? This is what we're talking about. Time is a resource, right? And some of us have got more or less of it. And, and, and that's what this technology does, is it starts to find ways to more, more reasonably and efficiently distribute access to that particular resource. Yes? People tell me that there's actually a huge cost to, 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 to use um, this methodology to track and make those transactions um, via your process. I mean, the energy consumption, I mean, I've, I've heard these, these, I've read these stories that 
there's more energy required to do this than the world has ever produced. <laughs> Those sorts. Of, can you speak to the energy well, consumption? Well, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. All of what you're saying is true. I think some of the uh, the, the magnitudes are a little little more okay, exaggerated than what the reality is. I mean, it we're nowhere near the sort of a global consumption of energy that, that goes into our global financial system, for example, right? Um, but there's a totally, absolutely legitimate concern that that proof of work, this particular function, has this arms race built into it that is driving up the, 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 the sort of use of energy uh, through Bitcoin, and that if we had ever reached that higher level, we might have environmental disaster, right? The thing is, and this is something that you just absolutely have to take away from this, I beg of you, this is not a static technology. It is, at, the, the, the biggest fail, I think the biggest failure anybody can make looking at this space is to assume, as you, like imagine when you said like, what, cell phones in the developing world, they can't possibly have cell, look how expensive a cell phone is. You're never gonna see cell phones across the developing world, right? There's now two for every one person in Africa. Um, because we're constantly driving down the cost and the efficiencies because there is a massive incentive to resolve some of these challenges. So, specifically, when it comes to transactions per second, and to emphasize your point, seven seconds a transa seven transactions per second is what Bitcoin does. So you're like, oh, like, like, why would you wanna do this? How is the world gonna ever use something as clunky as this? Well, innovators are working on solutions, right? So they talk about these things called, and I can, we can go into the sort of deep cryptographic a aspects of it because it gets kind of complicated. There's a thing called um, Lightning Network, which, which lifts to a layer outside of the chain the transaction capabilities. And so now we have a channel, a payment channel, between two people that can then be turned into a network of channels. And, and those transactions don't have to be proven to the blockchain. Now, the question might be, well, then I can't trust them, right? Well, you can. There's, 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 there's this cryptographic chaining function that then allows either party on either end of those exchanges to close out or, or open either side of the transaction to the blockchain. This is actually, in theory, open to, I don't know, millions of transactions because it ceases to be relevant, the computational power of the system. It lifts it out of that realm. It's a little bit like thinking about how many transactions is the dollar capable of doing, right? Literally physical dollars. How many? Like infinite, right? Uh, similarly, you know, when we close out those transactions in the dollar, we would be depositing money into our bank account. That, that would be one analogy the way you can think about this. The point is simply to say that there is just a crazy amount of innovation going on precisely because there are just thousands and thousands of very excited developers laying down open source code to try to figure out some of these problems. And energy is one of the solutions they're going after. Um, there's, a different, there's different forms of algorithmic proof. That, so rather than a proof of work, there's a thing called proof of stake. There's proof of delegated stake, there's proof of authority, proof of, there's a whole range of these things that have come out now. Um, and we're gonna get there, I think so. I mean, will we ever have Bitcoin as the payment rails for the world? Maybe as an intermediating currency, probably, maybe not. I don't think people will necessarily jump to the Bitcoin as their unit of account. But again, the biggest value it provides is this bedrock of an unchangeable system. So I, I think, personally, I think Bitcoin's gonna probably end up as a world's reserve asset. Uh, it, it has the poss possibility to be so, that, that we will have this as our sort of digital version of gold. Um, and that, that's in itself a function, whether or not it's gonna be viable as a, as a payment vehicle. So again, the key point, think about the great variety of, of innovation that's going in here and rather think about it as a, as a static concept. Yes? Yeah, I, I'm also uh, having trouble separating the value of the blockchain for, from the need for it to be associated with currency. And so, for example, I'm wondering why this decentralized ledger couldn't be, say, overlaid on fiat accounts to verify their balances and transactions, um, if that's what the, the big worry is. But I think comparing it to, uh, you know, electricity, telephones, um, that sort of transformative technology when you know, we all have bank accounts that exist now. I don't think anyone's bank account is being regularly hacked and, and getting money taken out. Um, I, I'm still trying to find a case for, for why the currency is a necessary part of this and the problem that it solves. Yeah, so um, you kind of answered your own question a little bit, uh, and I'll tell you why, because you know, there's all these other functions. I started out by talking about record keeping. 
and just, just sort of separate, and that's to separate the currency away from just like keeping of records, right? So Facebook is a record keeper, right? They're keeping records of, of our activities and, and they're doing it in a rather centralized way and some people aren't very happy about that, right? Um, Equifax is a centralized record keeper. Um, Home Depot is a centralized record keeper. Uh, our entire system is built by siloed honeypots of data keepers. Uh, so the value may not be in the currency. I, I'll give you that, at least from the application layer. So the idea of a you and I and what we interact with, we might not really care about the currency. Um, but this functionality of decentralized control of ledger keeping, I'll stand by the idea that it goes way back for centuries as being a profoundly different way to manage information. And um, what I would say about the currency, though, is that um, you know, it's important to think about the way it works within the Bitcoin and other permissionless systems, not so much as a medium of exchange between individuals, but rather as the reward system to keep this permissionalized structure. So the only way to really resolve the question about whether or not a, a digital cryptographically controlled currency, a decentralized currency, is important for the purposes of a blockchain or a distributed ledger is to engage in the debate about whether or not we're happy with a permissioned system or a permissionless system. Because a permission system doesn't need the currency, right? I've got 16 banks and they all agree to keep the ledger together and they don't need to exchange a currency because there's no you don't need to incentivize each of them to do the computation. It's now just gonna go on their own. The problem with that, right, if we think it's a problem, so it's, a, it's a debate, right? The other thing about that is a much more efficient system. So to this gentleman's concerns about electricity consumption, a permission ledger is not going to consume anywhere near the amount of energy because they're not racing and competing with each other to try to get a currency. So there are real benefits, at least in this sort of rudimentary sense, to think about why a permission ledger is valuable. But it is, it is definitely falling short of this goal of permissionlessness. And when you say, I don't know any friends who have got any their banks been hacked, Talk to an Argentine about what it is to have you know, uh, a, a currency that they can't trust. Or talk to somebody, again, Argentina or Venezuela, who's had their bank account frozen, or Cyprus, or any of these places, right? We happen to live under the privilege of a system that up until now, and it hasn't always worked, by the way, has worked. In fact, nine years ago, I would argue it didn't work, right? So um, the, 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 the bottom line is that um, there is there is a need. So think about the currency in this case as, a, as, the, as the vehicle that enables the permissionless network. You wouldn't be able to do it without it. Do we want a permission system or a permissionless system? And I worry, for example, about 16 banks controlling the ledger of the financial system. I would think that would be a too big to fail blockchain, which would be worse than a too big to fail bank. Right? They would hold the entire ledger. They would use that to hold us hostage, not just their own singular accounts. Now, could we create a permission system that was sufficiently varied and there was a misalignment of interest such that there wasn't just banks but also an insurance company and uh, maybe a regulator was in there and maybe a union and, and, an, and an NGO and the IMF and something like that, right? And we got this, you know, very unlikely for this group of people to collude. Then we start, then we maybe have a more reliable de facto form of decentralization, right? This is, this is an open debate. I, I think that we, we need to think about all of these, this spectrum of centralization versus decentralization, but that's the question, not whether or not we need a currency, right? Because the currency is what gets us to the, to the permissionless extreme. So, so that, that to me is, the, is the, the key way to approach that particular question. Yeah, okay, we're done? Good, thanks, Brian. Thank you. Thank you.